Welcome aboard the Bodies Breakfast. Um, I hope uh, there's a few of you out there. Sanctuary Cove Boat Show weekend this weekend, so maybe there's a few people um, at the Welcome boat show. The um, What's happened? That's lag. Um, I went to the boat show on Thursday and uh, had a good day there. It was good to go on Thursday because not too many people around, so it's not as busy as it is on the weekend. And uh, I met a few of you guys uh, while I was there. So I saw Pete and Richard um, and a few others. So, uh, look, thanks for coming up and saying hi. It's always good to catch up with uh, some of my viewers. And, uh, yeah, we had a bit of a chat. It was uh, really good. Plenty of big boats and lots of new gear. I'm blown away by the electronics that are going around at the moment. Um, just phenomenal, some of the, the stuff they're doing with touchscreens and all that sort of thing. But anyway, this weekend, um, we've decided to have a look at paper charts. I got a, a, a message from Mark who asked if we could do some work on uh, paper charts. So um, we're going to do that this morning. First thing I'd like to point out is just how hard it is and how expensive it is uh, using paper charts. Um, I've been using charts. I started navigating before... GPS and uh, and chart potters were around. So I've still got my old charts. Um, they probably badly need up, up, updating. Uh, actually, they're probably that old. Once you keep a chart for about 10 years and don't update it, it's not really worth having it updated. You, you're better off buying a new chart. But, um, you know, it is quite a cumbersome way of doing it compared to using a chart plotter, but we'll go over that. And I'm going to give you a basic run through of uh, what charts you should look at and uh, and how to use them. Okay, first off, this is a good little trick, I guess. This is where I keep my chart, down in uh, one of the lockers in the boat. It's just made out of, of uh, PVC with a cap on one end and a screw cap on the other end. And... Um, I can, it keeps them dry, it's all sealed up and uh, you can see the charts all rolled up in there. And a lot better to roll your charts up when you store them. If you fold them, they tend to get creases in that you have to work around when you're doing your chart work. So I've got quite a few charts for all up and down from the top of uh, Cape York all the way down around Tassie uh, in a couple of these tubes and that works pretty well. Of course, if you're on a bigger boat, you might have a dedicated drawer um, that you can keep your charts in, but uh, look on smaller boats, it really is, um, they take up a fair bit of room and it's a bit of a problem. Okay, um, the charts cost $38 each. Uh, so each chart that you use will cost you $38. Uh, to buy chart 5011, which is the symbols and abbreviations book, is about $59. So you started to look at a bit of expense and you're, going, you're not going to be able to travel the coast. If you're traveling the complete east coast, you're probably going to need around about 20 charts. So do the sums, 28, uh, 20 times 38, it becomes quite expensive. And then really to keep them, you've got to update them regularly, um, which you can do yourself, but your chart, a chart agent will do it for you for a cost. Uh, and look, at it just... It, it is a lot harder than using a, a good chart plotter in GPS. But anyway, a basic rundown of uh, chart work. First thing we're going to do is look at the other tools you need uh, when you're using charts. So on the chart here, you can see we've got a few of the tools you're going to need. Definitely going to need a pencil and uh, HB and sharp so you'll need a pencil sharpener as well so you keep it nice and sharp you'll need an eraser or a rubber to rub out your workings a pair of dividers i've had these for years but um a pair of dividers for measuring distance how you hold the dividers you hold them in your hand like that and you can push them to open them up or use your fingers to close them like that so that's how you adjust them okay so a good pair of dividers. you can use the cheaper ones that you buy at woolies and uh as long as it's a pair of dividers, you can adjust uh, the points on. And I like to use a Breton plotter or some sort of plotter. Um, these uh, plotters, you can use parallel rules for marking your courses off and, and marking your bearings on, on the chart. If you're using parallel rules, what you need to do is use the compass roses on the chart and you'd use your, your uh, parallel rules to 
get your bearing and then you could move it across. So you could take a bearing from there and run it across to here using the old click clacks or the parallel rules. I find the plotters are better because you can lay it on the chart and dial in what you're doing. And, and when the boat's moving around, if you're trying to use parallel rules, it's a little bit hard, but if you can just mount, put that on the chart and move the centre rows, it just seems to make it a lot easier for me. So on smaller boats, I think a plotter's a better investment than a set of parallel rules. Uh, you'll also need some sort of hand bearing compass. We uh, featured this on one of the other boaties breakfast the other day, and uh, you'll need some means of taking a bearing from a land-based object. So um, this this one, I found this 20 years ago, thought it was the bee's knees uh, because it actually stores bearings in it, whereas with the old hand bearing compass, I, I haven't got that great a memory short term anyway. <laughs> I used to have to uh, go out with a hand bearing compass, take the bearings and then write them down. This one actually um, stores the bearings on it. How you use it, you just use it like a rifle sight. So I could take a bearing off something there and then I could take a bearing off something there. Okay. If we come back and have a look, you can see that the bearings are stored in its memory. So then you can bring them back to the chart table and um, work those bearings off. So that was a, a real bonus as far as I was concerned. I've still got it. They don't make them anymore. GPS has put uh, these things, made them redundant, so you can't buy them. So when they eventually break down or, or die, that'll be the end of it. Okay, so there's some of the tools you need. Let's have a look at the charts and what you can get off them. I'll just clear this off a bit. Quick cup of tea. Hope everyone's got a cup of going. Who have we got on there, Bev? We've got Richard. Oh, good to see you off the hard there, Richard. I hope you're in relaxation mode at the moment. And Mark, good morning, Mark. Uh, yeah, you'll enjoy the show. Jerome, how you going, mate? <coughs> and uh, Mark Sudo, look, thanks, mate. Um, let's have a look at this and uh, we'll see if we can show you really why you should be using a chart plotter, I guess. Okay, so we've got our charts. Let's have a look at them. Um, when you look at the chart, uh, you can see the chart has got what they call a chart title. So this is the chart title up here. It's got some information on it. The area the chart is uh, relevant to. You can see there, I hope you can see there, it's got soundings in fathoms under 11 in fathoms and feet. So this chart, all of the soundings, which are all the little numbers you can see on the chart, are what are, what are, what are called soundings. They're the depth, actually, of the water there. And on these charts, the soundings are in fathoms and feet. So be aware of that. If you're working on the older imperial charts, uh, the soundings will be in fathoms. Now, these soundings on all charts, whether they're metric or imperial, they reduce the soundings to what they... Um, to what they call lowest astronomical tide, usually, and it'll tell you on the uh, on the chart um, the chart title where the soundings are reduced to. But usually, it's to lowest astronomical tide. Now, the lowest astronomical tide is the lowest tide you'd expect to see nearly ever. Uh, so it's a very low tide level. So usually, when you're using the charts. Any number you see on the chart is the lowest amount of water you'd expect to see there at any time. Now, don't be fooled by it because I think once or twice, I can't remember, I definitely once I've seen a tide that was lower than LAT. So it can, the tide can go out a bit further than the lowest, lowest astronomical tide, but not, it's a pretty rare occurrence, okay? Um, so be aware of that. But usually, the, the numbers you see, the sounding you see on the chart are the lowest depth of water you're going to find there at any time. So uh, with a high tide, of course, you're going to add that amount to the sounding. With a low tide, you'll subtract it down to the soundings. But all, at all times, there should be some sort of water at that sounding. So on the imperial charts, the soundings, soundings are in fathoms and feet. Uh, and on uh, a metric chart, the soundings will be in metres. Now, you can see that um, there's other information on the on the um, other information on the uh, chart title. 
Uh, we've got a bit on tides here. We've got the scale of the chart. So this chart is a uh, natural scale of one to 250,000. Now, when you're buying charts, you want to buy them probably, it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a trip up the coast, one to 250,000, one to 300,000, or even a bigger scale, gives you a lot of area that that's, the chart's going to cover. But if you come down in scale, you get a lot more detail, okay? We do this on a chart plotter really easily by just scrolling up and down through the scales on a chart plotter. So it's pretty easily done. But if you're using paper charts, you'll have a large scale chart that gives you a lot of distance. If you have a look down the corner of this chart, this is what they call a plan on the chart. And this plan is a certain area of this chart, which from there, this is just giving you a, bigger, a bit more detail on Platypus Bay on that part of the chart there. So you can see here, um, this is Platypus Bay, and this is a scale of one to 100,000. So it's come down from one to 250,000, about half the scale uh, of, the, of the main chart. So plans are a good way of getting a bit of detail when you're using a chart. I might just slip this one off. This is an imperial chart, the bunker group in Harvey Bay. We're just going to slip up to um, Low Isles to Cape Flattery. Now, this is an uh, a metric chart. And you can see it's a bit more colourful. So straight away, you should know if you're working on a metric chart just by the colour. But if that doesn't get you in pretty bold print down here in the corner, you can see depth in metres. So um, that it indicates uh, that it's a metric chart. Also in the corner of the chart here, you'll see the chart number. So this chart is AUS831. And that's how you uh, buy your charts. You go to a chart catalogue and buy the charts you need by their numbers. Um, here's the, the chart title again. Lots of information on currents. You probably can't read this. Two-way routes, that'll be this um, shipping channel up through the, uh, the reef. Um, satellite derived positions. So it's going to tell you that if you, you're putting a, a, a GPS position on this chart, there's going to be an offset for satellite derived position. Mined areas, compulsory pilotage, that'll be for bigger ships through the uh, reef and protected areas. So a fair bit of information on the chart title. You can see that. You can see the, uh, Jay, be quiet. You can see the, the scale of this chart is one to 150,000. So you can see on this chart, there's a lot more detail of the reef areas up there. Okay, now other parts of the chart that we need to know, I'll just have a look at this, I'll pull this one down too. And you can see up in the corner here, we've got another plan. And this plan is drawn at one to 10,000. So that gives you a lot of detail of the entrance into Cooktown. So it'll give the leads and the, the, the mud banks. Uh, on these um, metric charts, anything coloured green is intertidal. So all of these green areas will come out of the water when the tide's out. The land is uh, coloured yellow and the depths of water go from blue uh, down to five metres and then deeper than five metres, the chart is white. So. Um, they're pretty easy to read, a bit easier to read the metric charts than the old imperial ones. Um, okay, so the other parts you're going to find on the chart are the scales on the side and the top and the bottom of the charts. So on each side, on each side of the chart, maybe hold that up there like that. Though. Got Bev trying to hold this camera for me. Okay, so on each side of the chart, you've got a scale. This is what we call the uh, latitude scale. Now, the latitude scale um, tells you what the parallel of latitude is at that point. So if you look down this chart, you'll see down here, when we're up at low aisles, that the latitude is around about 16 degrees. Well, there's the 16th parallel of latitude, okay? So you can see it's marked there, 16 degrees. And um, that's, if you went on this bigger chart, if you go right up the top here, follow me up there, right up the top to there, there's 15 degrees. So there's one degree of latitude, okay? So from 15 degrees, 
down to 16 degrees. That is one degree of latitude. Now, they break that latitude up into smaller divisions called mi minutes. So in that one degree of latitude, there'll be 60 minutes uh, of latitude. And you can see, if I get in a bit closer, you can probably see that they're sort of shaded differently. So that's 16 degrees. Counting back, that's uh, 15 degrees, 55 minutes, 15 degrees, 50 minutes. And then in between those five minute uh, sections, there's one, two, three, four, five minutes of latitude. Okay, so they don't draw the lines right across the chart. At 45 minutes, uh, 15 degrees, 45 minutes south, they've drawn a line. At 15 degrees, 30 minutes south, they've drawn a line to give you a bit of a thing. But if they drew lines all the way across on every minute, it'd make the, the chart a bit messy. It'd be a bit hard to read. So um, that's how that works. Now, the latitude scale, the parallels of latitude, they're measured from the equator north and south and they run parallel to the equator. So by using them, we know that one minute of latitude is equal to one nautical mile in distance. So one, uh, one minute of latitude is equal to one nautical mile in distance. So we can measure our distance off the latitude scale. So have a look. If we're trying to, saying if we're trying to work out, get back down the chart there, Bev. So we're trying to work out what the distance is from uh, Snapper Island, that's up north of Cairns, up to Cape Trib. We can use our dividers to m mark that distance. And then if we run it across to the latitude scale, I'll bring it up to here. Okay, so that's our distance. You can see we've got 5, 10, 11, 12, 13.5 nautical miles. So just by using the latitude scale, you can work out what the distance is between um, Snapper Island and Cape Trib. Now, if you're going to do that, make sure that when you measure your distance, bring it straight across to the edge of the chart because the the uh, scale will change a little bit in difference in the in the length of the chart. So if you're measuring it there, you can go either side. You can bring it across to that side, or you can bring it across to that side. If you're measuring up here though, take it across to there. Take it straight across. It's uh, really good practice because. Um, it will change a little bit if you don't do it. You cannot measure distance off the longitude scale on the top and bottom of the chart. You can't measure it because these are meridians of longitude. They meet at the poles and they radiate out around the earth. So the longitude scale, you just can't uh, measure distance at all. You've got to use the scales on each side of the chart. And be aware that charts can either be drawn in... Um, it's this portrait, portrait, a, a portrait type chart. So this is taking up a fair bit of coast. So this is a portrait chart. But you can also get charts drawn in the landscape form. So this one is the same size chart, but it's drawn as, you better show that there. So, so, so that's, uh, there's a portrait chart there. There's a landscape chart there. And one's metric, this one's imperial. So this is in fathoms and feet, this is in metres but uh, the same deal. So even on this chart, if you're measuring um, distance, you have to come across to the side of the chart to measure on the latitude scale. Okay, I hope, I hope I haven't lost everyone already. And of course, if you're looking at um, fixing a position using latitude and longitude, I'll go back to the coloured chart, it's probably a bit easier for you guys to see. And I hope you can see it all right. Any comments there, let me know. It's a bit hard the way we're doing it. But, um, okay, H have a look on this chart here. If you're trying to work out a position on the chart, uh, say we wanted to know, make it pretty easy, what, what that position there was. We, we worked out we are in this position here and we wanted to know what it was. What we to work out what that position is, I'd run a, a a rule across parallel to the line there, and pick up what the um, what the reading is there. So if you look at that, it's uh, fifteen degrees fifty two minutes. So that'd be fifteen degrees fifty two minutes 
so 52 minutes, you draw it like that little thing, and that is south because we are south of the equator. So these lines of latitude run north and south of the equator. In Australia, you're always going to be south of the Australia, so it's 15 degrees, 52 minutes south. The longitude is going to be a little bit harder, but to work out our longitude, I'll do it with the dividers, run it across to that line there, bring it down to the bottom of the chart. So we're at, this is 146 degrees, so that longitude is 145 degrees, 55 minutes east. So that's 146 degrees, 45 minutes east. And that's east of Greenwich Mean Time. So that would be a Latin long for that position. Okay. Um, I'll just go back to the the Harvey Bay chart. I'm just going to go basically into it. It is quite quite complex. And look, there are some really good um, there's some really good uh, instructional videos on YouTube. If you want to get on uh, YouTube and just uh, Google them up, I'll try and leave some links at the end of this video. But there's some good stuff already done there, so I don't want to cover it all again. I'll probably the most important thing I'm going to try and give you out of this is just how difficult and expensive it can be using paper charts. And I think if you back yourself up with uh, Navionics on your phone or your iPad and use your chart plotter, it's a lot simpler way to go, especially on smaller vessels where you can find the space and, uh, and, and it is cheaper in the long run. But anyway, I'll just give you a little primer on how to use a paper chart to travel up the coast. Let's say we're going to do a trip from... I'm going back onto my Harvey Bay chart, which is uh, probably a bit more familiar to a lot of you people. So let's say we want to do a trip from Burham Heads uh, up to uh, the Burnett River. No, we won't do that. We'll do it from the fairway mark on uh, into the Great Sandy Strait up to the Burnett River. First thing we do is just get our plotter. You can see the fairway beacon there, so that's the entrance to the, the Sandy Strait, the channel. I can put it on that beacon and then put the other end up to the mouth of the Burnett River. Now you'd have a look along there, make sure you're not running into any land masses or rocks or anything like that. And I can draw a line from the fairway mark to the mouth of the Burnett River. What I do then is put a little arrow on that line to show you the direction we're going to travel in. Now, we want to know what direction we've got to steer. So we're going to be steering by the ship's compass. We'll probably turn the autopilot on uh, unless we love steering. But we're going to try and steer by the ship's compass. All of these charts are, are printed in what's called true. So um, the top of the chart is going to be true north. The bottom of the chart is going to be south. The right-hand side of the chart's going to be east and the left-hand side of the chart's going to be west. And they print them in what's called true. So we, what we need to be able to do is take this line we've drawn on the chart is drawn as a true line. So what we're going to need to do is convert that true line into a compass course. So how we do that, the first thing we've got to do is work out what the bearing is of that line on the chart as a true line. Now, we could do it with our compass rows here. This is, gives you um, 360 degrees on the thing, and they're, they're spread over the chart. With parallel rules, you'd set them up through the compass rows, and, well, what you'd do on your course, you'd work out what your course was. You could move that across till it came through the compass rows, and then that would give you your bearing, which looks to be about... 316 degrees. With the protractor, what you do is put it on your course line. So you just sit it on the course line there. I hope you guys can see all this. Um, make sure that this arrow is in the direction you're traveling. And then you just adjust the protractor in the middle and you can slide this along the course line so that you can get closer to a line of, that's drawn across the chart. I'm looking at the latitude lines or the longitude lines. So if you're lining up in a longitude line, you line this part of the grid up on them. If you're lining up on the latitude line, you're going to use the horizontal ones on it. So if I just come down here and get it pretty close to those lines, I've got this set on our course. 
I'll just line that up to this. I'm actually picking up this 25 degree latitude line and that's going to give us a bearing. So then I can just pick it up off the chart and read off what the bearing is and it's 310, 315, 316 degrees. So I write that in there, 316 degrees and I put next to it T for true. So 316 degrees true. Now, that's great. We know what the course is on, on the chart, the true course, but we've got to work that back to a compass course. Now, I'm going to instill in your heads, hopefully, a couple of little ditties, okay? This is how I learned it 35, 40 years ago. Okay, if you can remember this, this is how I learned it. Timid virgins make dull company, okay? Now, later in life, I taught navigation at uh, the Bundaberg Marine College, and they told me I couldn't teach it like that. It was a bit sexist, and we had to teach it as TV makes dull company, whatever way you want to learn it. But in my head, every time I do any chart work, I'll pick up a pencil, and I'll think, yep, timid virgins make dull company. It just pops out of your head straight away. This is just a little ditty to help you work from true, T, through to C, compass. Okay, so... Uh, T is for true, V is for variation, magnetic variation, M is magnetic, D is deviation, and C is compass. So we're going to have to work, work through this course line we've drawn to get it um, back to a compass course. So we've got, we've got one figure already, 316 degrees true. So I'm going to write that underneath the T. 316 degrees. Variation. What's variation? Your compass needle points at the magnetic field generated by the Earth, and that magnet magnetic field varies. There's lines of um, magnetic flux that run across the Earth, and it varies from year to year. You've got to know what the variation is, and to find what the variation is, you look at your compass rows, and if you have a look there, and I don't know if you can see on this one, but here it's got written magnetic variation, 9 degrees, 50 minutes east. So it's east of north. So the magnetic variation has swung to the east of north. Uh, and it says here it's increasing about three and a half minutes annually. So you can work all that out. And it does vary a little bit. But let's say for the, the sake of it that our magnetic variation is about 10 degrees east. So variation can be east of the of zero or it can be west of zero okay so let's say that uh, just for the sake of this argument to make it easier for me to uh, calculate it we'll say that the variation is 10 degrees east and when i'm writing these things down i like to write the true the magnetic and the compass bearings down in three um three figure uh notation but variation and deviation, I'll just write it down as 10 east and whatever the deviation is. Now, here's another ditty you've got to learn. Error east, compass least. Error west, compass best. And variation and deviation are both errors. So they're errors in working from true to compass, okay? So we've got east variation there. So error east, compass least. So what we're going to do, we need the compass to be less than the true bearing. So we're going to take that 10 off the 316. And even I can do that calculation in my head. So that's 300, uh, 306 degrees. So our magnetic bearing has been 306 degrees. Now, the other um, area you've got is deviation. Deviation is the amount of... Uh, deflection of the compass needle you get from your vessel. Now, if you're on a steel boat, their compass needle can be deflected quite a bit because of the mag magnetic fields on the boat. But even if you're on a fiberglass boat or an aluminium boat um, or a wooden boat, there's going to be some sort of a deflection of your compass needle because of the motor in the boat, other metal parts that are going to affect it. So you're going to have some sort of deviation. The only way you're going to know what your deviation is is to get a compass adjuster to come onto your boat, adjust your main steering compass, and he'll take you out and do a run. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of an expensive exercise as well, but he'll go out and do a run and, and steer the boat on lots of different courses, 
and you'll end up with your compass being adjusted so that it's nearly right, but it won't be quite right. And then he'll give you a deviation table, so a table of deviations, and that'll be what the difference is between the course you're trying to steer and what actually the compass is reading. So that's what deviation. It's going to be different on every boat, so it's not something you can pick off a chart or something like that. It's just uh, something that your boat affects the compass in that sort of way. So it's going to be um, particular to every sort of vessel. Okay, so. I haven't got, I have got a, a, a de, being in survey my vessel originally, I have got a deviation chart on the boat. Um, look, I think that in most cases on a fiberglass boat, the deviation is going to be very minimal. You could probably leave it out of the equation if you wanted to and navigate pretty safely. But if you want to do it by the book, you've really got to take it into, into account. So I don't like teaching you anything that's not correct. Okay, so let's say that on this course, and you have a look at your uh, deviation table, and at 300 degrees, it probably, let's say that we've got, for the sake of it, we've got four degrees westerly deviation. Okay, so let's, we've had a look at our imaginary uh, deviation chart. So I'll write in there four degrees west. Okay, so we've got westerly deviation on this course. So we go down to this little ditty, error west, compass best. That means that the compass end of this equation has got to be better than the true end. So we're going to add that to the magnetic um, heading. So if I add that on there, how easy is this? 310 degrees is going to be our compass course. What I do now, I go to the chart and I write 310C, just under that mark there. Okay, now we know that this course line it's 316 degrees true, but by our steering compass on the boat, we've got to steer a course of 310 degrees uh, by the compass. So by rights, if we left from the fairway boy, I'm one, and we wouldn't be able to see the entrance to the Burnett River because it's, um, well, let's measure how far away it is. And here you do this. There's 10 nautical miles. Sorry, that's not 10 nautical mile. There's 10 nautical mile. 10. Let's cancel that in my hand. So 10, 20, 30. About 33 nautical mile. So we've got 33 nautical mile to travel, and we're going to steer on a course of 310 degrees by the compass. Okay, so we can set that up and start heading. We wouldn't be able to see our destination, but we could head along that imaginary line we've drawn on the chart. Now, as we're travelling along that line, certain things are going to affect us. The tide's going to affect us, and also the wind could affect us. So a thing called set and drift, and this is another navigation lesson that if you want to get into it, does get quite deep and quite heavy, but you've really got to allow for set and drift uh, when you're travelling on a course like that, especially over a long distance. Okay, so... Have a look on the chart here. This is the course we want to steer, but we could be heading at three, we could have the boat heading at 310 degrees by the compass, but the tide could be flowing out of Harvey Bay, and instead of heading along that line, we could be getting pushed north and still be on that heading. So the boat could be going that way. Conversely, if the tide was coming in or we had a, a strong northerly blowing, um, we could be drifting off course and we could still be pointing at 310 degrees by the compass, but we could be travelling like that. So we need to know uh, that that was happening. Now, of course, on your chart plotter, virtually it's real time, so you know where you are all the time. But when you're doing it this way, what you need to do is fix your position every hour. So say we're travelling at 10 knots. If we do a bit of dead reckoning... Um, say at 10 knots, oh, wait, wait on, let's have a look at this, try a bit better. Let's say we're doing, I travel at about six knots, so let's say we're doing six knots. At six knots, we would think that we, our vessel would be at that position in an hour's time. So six knots, six nautical miles in an hour. So if we travel six nautical miles, that would be our position. We'd want to fix our position uh, after that first hour. 
So what we do, we take our hand bearing compass and we find a couple of land masses or features that we could see, that we could actually see from the boat. So on the chart here, there's a couple of radio towers. They're marked on the chart here. Uh, and you can see them from here, you'd see them quite easily. They're covered in red light, so it'd be quite a good uh, thing to fix your position on. And you would also be able to see Barham Point. That's um, a little bit obvious, a bit low. It's probably not a really great thing to fix your position on, but it'd give you a pretty good idea. So there's two land-based objects you could see from the boat. What we do, we use the um, hand-bearing compass to sight from the boat to that position and sight from the boat to that position. So once we've done that, we could then bring those, I'm not sure what the bearings are, but we could bring those bearings in and lay them off on the chart. And let's see, let's have a look and see what we've got here. Okay. So I'm saying that from there to that position, Oops. What's that? Nothing. Let's say we've taken a bearing there and we reckon that it's uh, from Cape Vernon, it's 349 degrees compass. So that's a compass course. So we draw a line from those towers to where our boat is. And we, we, that, that puts us sort of back there somewhere. Oh, sorry, I've drawn that wrong. Where's my rubber? I've taken off Cape Vernon instead of the um, the towers, and the towers are pretty easy to see. You'd be able to you'd be able to identify them pretty well. So I draw that line in there. The other one was uh, Burrum Point, so we draw a line from Burrum Point. Whatever the, the uh, hand bearing compass told us was the bearing, uh, which I'm thinking I said was. Oops. Zero five eight. So O five eight degrees. So that's from Burham Point. Okay, so that's from Burham Point. Where those two bearings intersect, that would be your position. And you can see that we have drifted off course a little bit to the north so probably the tide taking us out still doing that but when, when you're doing that this bearing you take here you've taken it with the compass so there are their compass bearing so your compass bearing would have been 300 i'm just making this up because um i've got to work it back 343 taken on the hand bearing compass when when i shot it um back to uh, the, the towers here, would have been 343 degrees. Uh, Burham Point, the bearing with the hand bearing compass would have been um, 052 degrees, I think it is, 052 degrees. So there your compass bearing. Now before you draw those lines on the chart, I'll rub them out again, we'll do it properly. Thing is, I had to try and find out what those bearings were going to be. So they're the bearings we've got with the hand bearing compass. Okay, they're compass bearings. We've got to work them back to true before we can draw any lines on the chart. So to the light towers there, 340 degrees. Our deviation is still four degrees west because that's the way our boat is pointing. So it's whatever way your boat is heading, that's how you're going to use your deviation uh, chart. So the errors west compass has got to be best. We've got to take that um, four degrees off, 343. So it's going to be 339 degrees. That's going to be our magnetic course. Our variation off our compass rose is still going to be 10 degrees east. So error east, compass end least, I've got to add that on. So it's going to be 349 degrees true. Okay, we've got to do the same with the other bearing that we took with the hand bearing compass off Burham Point, and that bore 100, uh, 052 degrees. The deviation is still going to be four degrees west. Error west, compass best, so we've got to take that off, so it's going to be 048. 
the variation is still 10 degrees east. Variation only changes with time, really. It's not going to change in a long time, like over years. Um, so variation 10 degrees east, error east, compass loose. So we're going to take that off, so it's going to be 038 degrees. That's our true course. So we've got now 349 degrees, 038. We can lay them off on the chart. So what we do there on the light towers, it's 349. I just set my protractor up at... 349 degrees, put it on the light tower, which is there, okay, and line up my uh, my rows. I've just lined it up with the bottom of the chart here virtually, so that, that's given me the, the thing there, and, and this is the bearing that's on the tower, so I'll draw that line out there. And then Burham Point, 038 degrees true. I'll just set the protractor up to 038 degrees true. I'll set one of these lines on the bottom of the chart again. <clears throat> so I've got that line on the bottom of the chart, this edge of the protractor on Burham Point, okay? Okay, so when we draw those two lines in, where they cross, where they cross is our position. So obviously, if you look at that fix, and that's a two-position fix, if, you, if you're doing it uh, in the real world, you might take another fix off Elliot Heads and get three lines in it to give you a more accurate fix. But with a, a two-position fix like that, you could say that, yep, that's our position there. We've drifted off course. The tide must be running out of Harvey Bay. We've drifted off course, and we're a bit further ahead than what we thought, but we're heading, we've drifted off a bit further to the north. So that's how you fix your position. Okay, I hope this information <laughs> isn't um, filling you with uh, too much information. Bev's shaking her head, saying, I don't know how you do it. But anyway, what are our, um, what are the guys saying there? They're getting a picture. Okay. All right. Uh, look, so so that's about you know without going into it too deeply, that's a pretty good uh, primer to um, to doing chart work, I guess. Um, and as you can see, it's it's quite difficult. And standing here in the kitchen on a big table and doing it is um, pretty easy on a boat where the thing's moving around and you're on probably a smaller area, you've got your chart folded in half, it can be a little bit of a problem. And um, I think that chart plotters um, really are the way to go. Make sure you back them up. Yeah, we're getting some comments. I'm just going to read through the comments, so bear with me a minute. Just move back a bit there. Let's try and scroll down through these. Okay, look, there's some good things, exactly what I was after, but on your mark, I'm, I'm glad it's covered a bit. Thanks, Jerome. <laughs> Thank God for GPS, mate. Richard says you'd be on a roof. Yeah, well, you can soon get yourself on a roof without uh, worrying about being on GPS, too, <laughs> um, Richard. But uh, carry your iPad as a, as a backup. It's, look, it, it's just so easy um, <coughs> doing it. It's just so easy doing it with uh, a chart plotter and a GPS. The only thing I can say to you guys is if you are, and I went to the boat show Thursday and look, some of the gear, the touch screens and the buses they've got for interfacing everything, and they've got everything on one screen. So you're, you're doing your nav, you've got your radar, uh, you turn the lights on and off on the boat, you've got the engine controls all on this one touch screen. And look, it's great until something goes wrong. So the only suggestion I can give to you guys is try and break this stuff up. On, on my boat, I've got a, a dedicated GPS. Uh, that interface is with my autopilot, but if something goes wrong with the GPS, the autopilot still functions. Uh, I've got a standalone radar. So if, if my GPS does go down and look, at it's, it's had to go to the, the tech probably three or four times and be replaced at one stage too. So I've had problems with it. But... Um, 
try and keep your your system sort of a bit split up if you go if you lose your uh chart plotter and it's got your radar on it and your echo sounder it really uh leaves you a bit naked okay so if i lose my gps straight away i go to navionics on my iphone or my pad and that backs up my charts but i've still got my radar uh i haven't got a uh, a depth sounder and probably something i've been thinking about putting on for a long while just a little standalone depth sounder with the actual depth on it because otherwise, um, you know, you, you're sort of flying a bit blind. Look, I hope that's been good for you guys. Um, it's a little bit complex and there's a lot more to it if you want to navigate on paper charts. It really is. But there's some great courses out there and I'd suggest if you want to learn it, do it. Um, what we could do, though, I just did a trip two weeks ago when I came down from uh, early on a, um, on a, a bigger powerboat and we navigated through the Sandy Strait at night. And we did it on GPS, but we also did it, I've got a good understanding of lights and, and shapes and things like that. So if you think it's worthwhile, I could probably do next week just covering um, marks you can see, like cardinal marks, lateral marks, how they're lit, uh, different types of light things. So if you think that's worthwhile, shoot us, uh, shoot us a comment and uh, we might cover that next time. Or look, if there's any other um, any other stuff you want to cover, please let us know and I'll try and cover it. I hope that's been informative. I've enjoyed doing it. Enjoy the boat show and, um, yeah, good luck, guys. We'll uh, catch you.